Okay. Um, yes, uh, for all of you, I've been asked if I could introduce uh, Gino Vigiani, Vigiani as uh, the lecturer today. And my name is Steinar Nordahl, and I'm in geotechnical engineering. And uh, I, we are then, we have been uh, knowing each other for quite some time, um, teaching in some courses together. Um, and um, we have been meeting in conferences and so on. And we had also worked together with PhD students. Uh, so close connection between uh, Grenoble and uh, Trondheim. Um, and uh, as you may see then already on the front page here, um, Gino has a uh, background uh, where he has been a leader of this labor laboratory for soils, solids, structures, and risk. And um, a lot of things have been done there in a very advanced and quite nice uh, laboratory. And it's a pleasure for us to go and visit. And then also my colleague was spending last year, or was it the year before actually, Gudmund, that you spent there uh, as a uh, sabbatical or actually a research term then there. And that was also a pleasure. So we stay close and we try to then uh, follow up. So we had some activity and uh, really in your laboratory, Gino, uh, from Trondheim with uh, uh, two of our PhD students actually. So we are very grateful for that. And uh, as you know, then, as, as you can see, Gino has a geomechanical background, partly geotech, but much wider than that, actually. So it's on rocks as well as soils, and it's uh, all kinds of materials. And um, we focus, for instance, on tomography, X-ray tomography, and then interpretation of these images and uh, recordings that we can get from there. And uh, it's really a pleasure to introduce you as a lecturer and look forward to what you will tell us. So thank you for doing this for us. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steiner. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you all. I, I consider it as a big privilege, especially these days in which we cannot travel in, in person. It's uh, such a privilege to have people uh, listening and what I, what I like. Uh, the, the title of the, to of the talk today, it's, uh, it's essential imaging processes. Uh, it's about imaging processes in geomaterials. That, uh, that include soil, rock, and, and you will see even some concrete. So we are talking about testing uh, with, uh, with uh, some recent advances. I should make it clear from the very beginning that there are other people working with me. And there are at least these two folks that I would like to mention in a, in a special way. Right away, they're Eddie Ando and Alessandro Tengatini. By the way, they both are Italian, uh, like me, so there is a sort of Italian connection here. Alessandro and Eddie are uh, have been, uh, they are much younger than, than me, and uh, they've been working a lot on these recent developments in uh, on imaging. I would say Eddie more on the X-ray side, Alessandro more on the neutron side, and these are the two things that I will be talking about today. So. Whenever we talk about these uh, full field methods in geomechanics and in geomaterials, uh, the amount of available methods is just impressive, it's amazing. So I do not, uh, I will not cover uh, all of these uh, uh, examples. I just want you to, to realize that we go from uh, magnetic resonance imaging to ultrasonic tomography, to diffraction, to infrared radiation, interferometry and uh, electrical resistivity. Uh, uh, rheography, there are so many of them. All these methods have in common the following things. They do allow for uh, characterizing heterogeneities. Uh, when I say heterogeneities, I mean both heterogeneities in the material, the material properties, but perhaps even more interestingly, heterogeneities in the processes that develop during a test. And when I say characterization, I mean both qualitative and quantitative, and we'll have we'll we'll show in a number of ways what I exactly mean by that. Now, clearly, all these methods, these full field methods, are very attractive for our material because heterogeneity, as we all know, is the rule rather than the exception. Whenever we talk of soils and rocks, these materials are heterogeneous in nature and by nature. Now, in the talk, I will of course. I won't be able to go in every single detail. Uh, that's why you find here three references. One is a, is a school book, in fact, is, a, is material that we gave to the students um, almost 10 years ago in a doctoral school that was held in Oswa. And some of you might know of these allergy materials with doctoral schools happening every year. 
and uh, you can download this material for free from the um, from the link that is given on the slide. There are also two more recent publications. One that I presented at the uh, last European conference in soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering, and the recent one with Alessandro Tengatini uh, that was uh, published on a journal that is called Geomechanics for Energy and the Environment. So you can find many more details over there. But let's come to the talk. I will only focus on two specific methods for the sake of time. One of them is X-ray, and the other one is Newton. I will give you a little bit of physics and a little bit of history. I understand that many of you are uh, or do have a background in physics, so I will not claim that I'm, that I'm from physics. I'm just a, a poor geotechnical engineer. I will show you a, a number of recent examples of application covering both application of X-ray, neutron imaging, and even more interestingly, a combination of the two together. And then I think it's interesting to, to point out those that, in my opinion, are the current challenges and the perspectives. Where are we now and where we go? Let's start with X-rays. X-rays and geomechanics did meet some 70 years ago, so it's not really new. Uh, these are historical pictures. Uh, on your left, you will see an example for sandstone. That's the early 60s. Uh, radiographs, uh, 2D images obtained by scanning with X-rays, a piece of sandstone. On the right hand side, you see a very famous example. This is coming from Cambridge, in which uh, uh, shear dilating bands are uh, imaged here and evident through, again, X ray radiography. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a bit more about X rays. What are X rays? Again, this is not a course in physics, so many of you might know it, but I think it's important that we state a couple of important things. Well, the first thing I want to say is this came out at the end of the 19th century. There was the first ever Nobel Prize in physics back in 1901. The hand that you see here with the ring is in fact the hand of the wife of Dr. Röntgen. So that's the very first image that was shown to the public. It was quite, a, quite an impressive image to show. You can see through the hand, you can see the bones, you can see the ring. But why do we see the bones, why do we see the ring? Because in reality, what we're looking at here is a map in two dimension of the attenuation coefficient, the attenuation to the X-rays. And it turns out that this attenuation coefficient in the case of X-rays is essentially proportional to density. So the denser the material, the more the X-rays will be attenuated, which is the reason why you see in very dark, the ring is possibly metallic, so high density, you see the bones were less uh, dark than the ring because they are not metallic, and you don't see the flesh. You don't see the flesh because that's clearly uh, much less attenuating than bones and ring. So radiographs are 2D maps of the attenuation of the X-rays as they travel through the object that is being imaged. That's radiograph. Now we are going to talk about tomography. What is tomography? Well, tomography. It's essentially an extension to three-dimensional radiography. What you need is to have many different radiographs that you take from different angular position, and then you need some maths. The maths was done back in 1917 by Dr. Ridden. If you combine many, and by many, I mean more than 1,000 uh, uh, different 2D images, you can reconstruct, that's the technical word, a 3D image that is not a picture, it's not a picture in three dimensions, it's just a map three dimension again of the attenuation. Here you see an historical picture. The first X-ray CT scanner was developed in, uh, in the medical environment. We're talking of 1972 and once again Nobel Prize, this time in medicine in 1979. So perhaps start understanding why I got interested in this thing. Perhaps one day eventually I'll get the Nobel Prize. Well, Unfortunately, the story doesn't go like that. There is another key person, that's my friend and colleague Jacques Beru. Uh, he was uh, crazy enough in the late 80s to say, why don't we try to apply X-rays to understand soil mechanics? So he got a triaxial test, that's a sun that we're compressing in triaxial compression. I'm quite sure that many of you might be familiar with this time of sun. We, we read on the textbook that here there is no strain localization, there is no failure plane, it's just bulging in what 
I was told when I was a student, it's a pretty much a homogeneous deformation. Well, if you have an X-ray scanner, you can scan the specimen, you will see inside the specimen patterns like this. This is again, uh, these are three sections at three different uh, elevations of a 3D image. And the 3D image is, as I said, a map of the attenuation, which in other terms means a map of the density. So what we are looking at here is that, uh, well, first, porosity is not a constant in the specimen, but the second information is even more important. This non-uniform, it is not random, it's organized in space, it's a pattern. So Jacques was able to discover hidden patterns of strain localization in a sun specimen that from the outside would look pretty boring and homogeneous. No Nobel Prize yet. Eventually this will come, I'm sure about it. Now, I want to convince you that uh, X-ray microtomography is a fantastic tool. So many of you might know already this movie. I've been showing it for now more than 10 years, but I still show it because I think it's very convincing. We are looking at the sun specimen and we are flying inside. So I'm going to show you experimental data, a 3D image of a sun sample obtained by using X-ray tomography. Keep in mind that the grains that you will see are in the order of uh, 300 micron in size and the voxel size, voxel being the 3D analog of what we all know being a pixel, so a unit of information. And here you go. Let's fly. So this is my specimen. That's an image coming out of a scanner. I have it on my computer and I can fly inside. It's like a video game, very much. Every kid would get excited by this possibility of flying inside. Now, this is a, an incredible power of tomography. You can see things, but you can actually go inside, explore the pore of space, discover that, uh, sorry for the DM people, grains are not spheres. Uh, you will see that they're very odd in shape. They can have holes. You can look at the way they touch each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is experimental data. This is the type of experimental data we can get today from X-ray tomography. I hope you were impressed enough. That was the only reason to show you this movie. But this is the data we are talking about. Now, it would be nice to know how can I get those data. Well, you need a scanner. That means you need an X-ray source, you need a detector, and then you need the system that allows you for multi-angular measurements. You need more than one radiograph. You can do that in three ways. The first one is the medical scanner. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that most of us uh, know this kind of guy. You don't go there for good reasons. You go there for sad reasons, but it happens that we need to do a scan. Then you have lab scanner, like the one that I will be uh, showing you today. And then you have the synchrotron. That's the, by far the best, uh, the best type. Now, in the case of medical scanner, the, uh, the positive side in this, this uh, tomography is fast. And there is a reason for that. Uh, tomography, x-rays are not good for our body, for uh, living cells. So you want to go as fast as possible. The price to pay is that the spatial solution is pretty low. If we go to the lab scanner, uh, you can get to very high spatial resolution, sub-micron, but of course there is a price to pay, and the price is that this is very slow. There is only one way to be both fast and high resolved in space, and that's the synchrotron. Of course, you cannot buy a synchrotron, you can use it, and there are many of these synchrotrons in the, on the planet, many of them in Europe, one of them is in Grenoble. Uh, by the way, this is not the one in Grenoble. Uh, it's uh, for free, provided you are able to write a proposal and to convince a scientific committee that you are going to do fantastic stuff. Now, in our lab, since now 11 or 12, 11 and a half years now, we do have a, a, a lab scanner. And some of you, Steiner and Goodman, have seen it. Uh, you have an X ray source, that's the red uh, guy here. It's a bazooka uh, shooting X rays. You have a detector on the other side. Please note that the beam is conical, very much like an overhead a projector. And then you have in between uh, something, something that you want to image. In this case, it will be a triaxial cell. So the distance between the source and the detector is given. You cannot change it. But what you can change is the relative position of the object 
If you put it very close to the source, you'll get uh, something like this. Actually, the closer you come to the detector, the more detail you will see. Uh, this is why we call this system a multi-scale uh, scanner. If you put your leaf, by the way, these are real images of a leaf that we got uh, in, on campus. If you put the leaf very close to the detector, you'll have a maximum field of view, but your voxel size will be pretty bad, 100 micron. The closer you come to the uh, source, the closer will be your view. So you'll be looking at things in much more detail. In this case, the voxel will be five micron in size, but of course you will only see part of the leaf. So it's up to you to decide what is the scale that is of interest. Now, we do not image materials only. We like imaging processes. And I wanna show you one thing that we typically do in our scanner. We take a triaxial cell, we install a sun specimen that's uh, as uh, uh, small as a cigarette, for those of you who still smoke, this is 10 millimeters in diameter, 20 millimeters in height. There is a grain of sand inside. We can image and reconstruct a 3D volume in which we recognize each of the roughly 60,000 grain in the sample. That's constant sand. And then besides the three dimension, you can add the fourth dimension that is time. So you can basically take this image while you're loading your specimen. So I'm running my triaxial compression and you see here a sequence of images that correspond a different instance of loading. So I get a full picture of the kinematics in which I can then, once I have this uh, rich image on my computer, I can actually look inside. I can look at the individual position of each of these grains. And by comparing one image to another, I can even compute or measure, I should say, the kinematics of each of these grains. So this is where Eddie comes. He defended this uh, PhD uh, seven years now, and he was uh, particularly interested in studying shear bending in dense sun. So I will just show you one result, one typical result. And I'm using the slides that are originally from his PhD defense, so back in 2013. So let's look at one test that was run by Edward Ando. That was the first test of his campaign. And it was run on a material that is called Caicos Uoid. Caicos Uoid is a very round uh, sun coming from the Bahamas. Uh, it uh, looks like a small potato, a small meaning, uh, let's say about 300 micro. Now, I'm gonna show you here a few slides. This is the macroscopic response. Can you see my, my pointer? You do see it, the mouse, yeah? So this is the stress ratio as a function of the axial strain. Here you get the volumetric strain as a function of the axial strain. So that would be the standard microscopic response out of a triaxial test. You see also here small spikes on this curve. The spikes correspond to those times of the test in which we stop the motor. This is a strain control experiment and we scan. Then we restart again and we come back on the same curve. So there is some axial stress relaxation. This is when we stop, we halt the, 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 the piston. This is macro. What's happening inside? I'll show you two different uh, uh, plots or maps. To the left, you get the deviatoric strain. So again, remember that the maps that I'm uh, constructing here are 3D maps. I'm going to show you just one slice, one section of this map. The deviatoric strain is a continuum mechanics concept. So we have been transformed the measured uh, kinematics of each individual grain into a strain tensor locally. And I'm showing you here only the second environment, uh, the deviatoric strain, if you like the, the size or the radius of the more circle of uh, the strain. To the right, I'm showing you the intensity of rotation. So here I am adopting a particulate or discrete mechanics approach, in which I'm looking at each particle. So I'm not transforming this into a strain tensor, but just looking at the way each particle rotates. Please remember that we are in three dimensions. So the rigid body motion of a particle in the hypothesis, of course, that this does not deform and doesn't break, uh, it's essentially a, 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 an array of six color coordinates. Three displacement in space for the central mass, 
plus three rotation in space. Rotation in space is, is a 3D quantity. What I'm calling here intensity is the norm of this rotation, uh, whatever the axis about which it, it is taking place. So continuum description, discrete description. I have color bars because these are measurements. So you see that here I go from 0 to 0.25 to the left, and they go from 0 to 30 degrees to the right. Then you will see here a small segment in black, and this is essentially telling you which increment are we looking at. So I start from here, first increment, these are incremental strain and incremental rotation. I would say at the beginning, things are pretty much uh, boring. Uh, I think that Eddie did a good job in preparing the specimen because I don't see any particular signs of non-uniformity. And also rotations are pretty much uh, low and uh, happening everywhere. And then I tend to approach the peak. And when I approach the peak, I notice that uh, either looking at the strain or at the rotation, uh, things are not as uniform as they were at the beginning. I can see that uh, by the time I get to the peak, uh, the shear strain is concentrating in a given zone of the specimen. And I can see it at the grain scale level as the grains getting more and more excited within the region that I will eventually call a shear band, while the grains that are outside of it essentially stay uh, sleepy. And if I go through the peak and then keep going in the post-peak region, you clearly see that this phenomenon becomes very clear. You get a high shear strain localization, and the grain scale counterpart of it is grains that can rotate a lot, even 20 or 30 degrees. But you see here the famous 10 to 15 uh, thickness, 10 to 15 D50 thickness, with all the other grains being essentially not participating to the party. Good, that's macro, that's micro, but again, with a continuum mechanics language and with a discrete mechanics language. This is very nice. You can get a lot of information, quantitative information about it. And okay, and I might show you 30 or 40 such tests, uh, but I think one is sufficient. Now, there is a number of amazing uh, developments for granular soil, because you see that's kinematics on the individual particles. I still remember how excited were we uh, about 10 years ago when we were able to go to conferences and say, wow, we have 60,000 grains in the, in, in the sand sample, and you know what? We can measure the rotation and displacement of each of them. And then at some point we started saying, okay, <laughs> nice, but what we do with all this information? Well, there are two things that we can do. One is to look at things that go beyond granular kinematics. For example, one might look at the grain to grain context, and this is something that we started doing. So you can look at the fabric tensor and the evolution of those quantities. You can also look at phenomena like grain breakage, in which you have production of fines. You can look at things like a cemented granular materials, in which besides the kinematics of the grain, there is also the debonding of the grains that is of interest. And then you can go into partially saturated sun, which you can look at many sky, or phenomena like chemical dissolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not only you can enrich the phenomena you look at, but you can also try to ask a more, sim a more important question that is, okay, what do you do with all this data? Why is this data important? Well, and here we might make, we might make a number of links to modeling. Uh, I've been uh, working on continuum models that are micromechanics inspired, but I can al also cite and mention the level set DM that is a recent work that we did in collaboration with the, with the Caltech and Jose and the other group. And we can measure a 3D fabric tent. So there are so many nice things that you can make it. But okay, I have just uh, two further examples. Uh, one is about the material and the other one is about the application. So this is sand, these are grains, but those of you who are geotech enough will uh, tell me, hey, Chino, remember that uh, in nature, we not only have sand, but we also have clay-like material, clay-like materials being fine grain. And then there is also some link toward the uh, geotech knowledge. Let's look at clay. Well, for a sand, things are conceptually pretty easy. What is the, the small scale. Well, for us, the small scale is the grain scale. I mean, the, the unit is clearly the, the grain. But how small is small for a clay? 
This is a, a, an example of a test that I ran many years ago at the synchrotron, in which the specimen was 20 millimeters in height, 10 millimeters in, uh, in diameter. And of course, we know that if you look at, uh, at the very uh, uh, little scale, this is a, a bib, broad ion beaming on boom clay, you can actually get these fantastic images in which you see particles, the clay particles. But this is what we want to look at. All right, this is an image that is obtained at a very, very small scale. This is one micron. So the voxel or the pixel size, I should say pixel because this is 2D, uh, it's really nanometers. Well, in reality, uh, I don't think that the particle scale the, in the case of clay is the right scale at which we should look at. And by the way, there is no way we can do it using X-rays. So I would suggest you, I would propose you to, I would like to share with you results from uh, uh, an experimental campaign run by my colleague Pierre Bezuel at the Synchrotron, in which he was playing a similar game, uh, similar to the one that I just showed for Sun, but this time on a clay stone. Now, this clay stone is coming from France, is the color of Oxfordian clay. We are talking now of a pixel size that is not 15 micron, like in the previous case, but 0.7 micron. So we're going sub micron. And of course, because of this, we need to go to very small specimen. I would like you to, to bring your attention on the fact that here the specimen is not 10 millimeters, it's one millimeter in diameter. So that's a nail. It's a nail of clay, of clay rock. Well, this is our specimen, very, very small. And, uh, and well, um, this is one of those days in which I was, I felt very proud and very lucky to have Pierre Bezuel among my colleagues, because I can tell you, in preparing such a specimen and installing it in a triaxial uh, environment is not an easy game. Those of you who know what triaxial testing of material is will appreciate this, uh, this picture. Now, when you actually look at the results, you see that a tomography is giving you very rich information. Do we see, now remember, this is 1.3 millimeter in diameter. These are sectioned through a volume. Do we see the clay particles? No, we don't. We see a clay paste that is this gray, gray background. However, we see into the paste a number of aggregates because a clay rock not only contains clay, but also feldspat and quartz and other things. Now, this is rich enough for us to actually apply digital image correlation and to measure in such a way strain field just the way we did for the sun. In this case, we will not be able to look at the kinematics of individual particles. We'll do just continuum mechanics. But yes, we can actually compute the strain field and, for example, represent the maximum deviatory strain. Well, so far, I've been talking about element test materials. How about lab scale physical models? I, as Steiner was saying, uh, I have a geotechnical engineering background, although I tend to forget it from time to time, but this is where I come from. So I like also not only investigating the, 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 the physical phenomena uh, that are uh, happening and are responsible for, for an elastic strain in a material, but also like to look at the engineering. And this is uh, 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 the face of somebody that you might know, Priscilla Paniagua, very Norwegian uh, family name, right? Well, Priscilla, uh, when she was still a PhD student, an extremely good PhD student, uh, together with Steiner and, and us, we, we came up with this uh, idea of looking at the penetration of a cone uh, in silt hmm, and looking at what is happening uh, while the cone is penetrating. That was amazingly interesting. Uh, of course, we couldn't see the individual grains because the silt and silt particles are too small to be perceived, but we could actually look at the penetration. And I'm just showing you two such images. You see here, we can actually quanti uh, quantitatively analyze this uh, sequence of images and get results like this. Here you see in three dimension, fields of incremental strain during a given five millimeter penetration step of CPT test, one to the left, one to the right. Here I'm going to show you the volumetric strain, and here I'm going to show you the deviatoric strain. So these are measurements. They are not only fancy and nice images, they're measurements. And they're measurements in three dimensions. And they are measurements that are made possible by the combined use of 
X-ray tomography plus image analysis. Uh, a few years later, another uh, uh, clever PhD student, uh, Jeanne, Jeanne Doreau, uh, Steiner might remember her, will uh, uh, play a, a similar game in which, again, we are using the, our X-ray system in what we call the micro-calibration chamber. In fact, we had a pile that was penetrated from the bottom, and we're looking at the effect of pile penetration, both in terms of kinematics and in terms of particle breakage around the shaft of the pile. What is interesting is that here we were using sand, so we could actually measure the evolution of kinematics of each individual grain, which is given very interesting results. And we were also looking at the amount of grains that break uh, along the shaft of the pile. So now even the engineers will say, OK, this can be useful. But I would like to go to neutrons. Uh, X-rays uh, are very nice, but more and more over the last five years, we've been using a, a, a complementary technique, neutrons. Now, neutrons and X-ray show different things. And if I want to convince you about that, I'm going to show you this simple image in which you have a neutron radiography here and X-ray radiography of the same object. And the object is a camera. I thought that was a, 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 an appropriate image to show you, show a camera. And you see that what is white here is black on the other side. And this is not only because I'm being intriguing with, the, with colors. This is just because different materials are differently sensitive to X-ray and neutron. They do attenuate the two radiations in a fundamentally different way. Look at this guy here, totally black, totally white. Why? Well, before explaining you why, I cannot resist the temptation of showing this one that I like a lot. That's a flower. It's a real flower. And in front of the flower, there are nine blocks of granite. If I try to X-ray scan this flower, I will be very unlucky. I will not. Because the, the granite is going to attenuate all the X-rays. There will be no X-rays getting on the other side. However, in this case, the uh, neutron go through the granite, but they don't go through the flower. That's why we can see it. And why so? Because of the water. We'll learn in a minute that uh, water is uh, attenuating a lot. Neutrons is really very much attenuating. So uh, water is essentially transparent to x-rays. It is not the neutron. But why? Well, the why, the because, is very simple. There is a fundamental difference between X-rays and neutrons. X-rays essentially interact with the electrons, whereas neutrons essentially interact with the nucleus. Now, this means that if you put the attenuation coefficient on the y-axis as a function of the atomic number, you'll see that the X-rays have a very linear kind of trend. The higher the atomic number, the higher the attenuation. You cannot traverse uh, metal, heavy metal, with X-rays. They will be attenuated. They will be stopped. If you actually look at the neutrons, the pattern is very different. It looks like it is completely independent uh, by the, from the atomic number. And this is actually the case. The, the, the absorption, in the case of neutrons, essentially depends on the structure of the nucleus. And it turns out that uh, hydrogen is attenuating a lot, much more than metallic. So here you see I'm representing by the diameter of this section the attenuation coefficient. And as you see, for the case of X-rays in green, it's increasing with Z. So that's aluminum. This is uh, uh, steel. In this case, there is no proportionality. It happens that hydrogen attenuates a lot. Well, this is something that we should keep in mind. I will be more clear in a minute. Again, bit of history. Is this completely new? Uh, not really. I could find, uh, and again, to the best of my knowledge, I could find the first Newton radiography for rock back in 73, and the first Newton tomography of rock in 99. So that's much more recent. In fact, neutrons are a much younger discovery with respect to X-rays. Remember, it was 1895 for X-rays. It was 1932 uh, for uh, neutrons, so almost half a century later. 
the most common ways to produce neutrons are nuclear fission and spallation. Uh, but this means that you need very large scale uh, sources like a nuclear reactor. We have one in Grenoble. Well, I don't think we are actually allowed to say that this is a nuclear reactor because it's in town and people will not appreciate it. So we say that's a source, a source, a scientific source for neutrons. But in reality, it's a nuclear reactor. Laboratory sources are essentially uh, non existent. Now, neutrons, as I said, are ideal for imaging fluids, for example, hydrocarbons, because hydrogen absorbs neutrons very well. So neutron imaging, in one word, is good for detecting water. There is one other thing that we should think of, that uh, the idea that there is a good penetration through materials such as steel means that I can actually think of imaging water moving in a rock or in a soil with the 100 megapascal confinement, which requires quite a heavy cell, uh, which is just impossible with X-rays. So you start seeing and understanding that the power of neutron is not of being better than X-rays, but rather being complementary to X-rays. What is visible with the one is not very visible with the other. Particular isotopes can be distinguished. For example, I can play by using normal water and heavy water, in which uh, deuterium is taking the place of hydrogen. These two waters have essentially the same physical properties, essentially, but in terms of attenuation, there is a ratio of about six from one to the other. And I have an example to show you the power of neutrons. Let's take this one. So what are we now looking at? This is the example of a, uh, excuse me. This is the example of uh, the same experiment in which I have a sandstone and I'm just trying, let's stop it. I'm trying to uh, look at the way in which water is entering from the bottom by capillarity in a dry sandstone specimen. So the experiment is very simple. I have my dry sample of sandstone. I put it on the table and then I put in contact with water from the bottom. What you see here to the left is what neutron radiography will reveal. And you see to the right what X-ray will reveal. And I think you can uh, very easily get convinced that uh, there are details that X-ray see in the material, neutron do not. But in terms of actual movement of the liquid front, Neutrons are doing a much better job. You can vaguely perceive the water getting uh, onward, moving upward in the using X-rays, but neutrons are just fantastic. So yes, neutrons are of interest. Now, if all the story was always a, a story like the one in the previous slide with the horizontal or pseudo horizontal front moving in the sample, okay, do we really need neutrons? Perhaps not. But you know, geomaterials are heterogeneous and they suffer from heterogeneous deformation. So here I'm suggesting you to have a look at a, a few uh, images of a laminate rock. So that's a carbonate rock with very thin layers that are called lamina that are oriented orthogonal to the axis. So the lamina are these guys that you see horizontal. This sample was pre-deformed uh, in dry condition in a triaxial compression experiment uh, at about 20 megapascal confined. After the formation, we took this specimen and we bring, brought, brought it to the, to the neutron facility. And we started looking inside. And this is what we saw. So you can clearly see here, this is a radiography. You see here the water starting from the bottom, getting through the pre existing localized region. And then uh, following essentially the uh, available uh, path. Another example might be this one, in which you clearly see something that is also quite interesting. You see the water is this one very dark because it's attenuating a lot. You see that there is a sort of reservoir here in which the water will uh, come and then stay here, filling this pre existing reservoir. And then the third one, the third one is also interesting 
because the third one is showing you a 3D image, which you can actually see what type of information we get about the fluid flow. Now, is this relevant? I think it is very much, not only because it's relating the mechanics and the hydraulics, but also because it's a clear message to us that whenever it comes to measuring things like the permeability of a material, you can actually measure how, how much water gets in, how much water gets out, and how long does it take. And you basically take a ratio and you call it a permeability. But then when you look at the way in which the fluid flow is actually happening, you will realize that this permeability has no actual meaning. It's just a bulk a measurement that is not connected to the actual uh, permeability of the structure itself. Good. Uh, actually, another example that I think is relevant is the idea of hydrofracking. We played this with the Jose Andrade and this group uh, a few years ago. We took a, a shale. It's called Marcello shale. It's very popular in the United States. And we took a slab of this with a hole inside and we injected water into the, into the center. Know that we are using here a very high uh, stress level. We are talking of 70 megapascal, that is quite representative of the actual situation in situ. And, uh, and this is what we get. This is an image from neutron tomography in which you see a number of fractures that in fact not only include those fractures that are due to the injection, but also a number of pre-existing fractures in any possible direction that open up uh, because of the problem. Well, yes, I was a geotechnical engineer, but I do believe that geomaterials include not only solids and rock, but also a bunch of other materials, and concrete is one of them. In the end, sorry, but concrete is just an artificial conglomerate, right? So we can play with the concrete as well. And this is a very interesting case in which we are looking at drying or, of concrete. The phenomena that is uh, under study is spalling. And I'm going to show you here what we can get with neutrons. So you see here the evolution of the, this is the drying front. So what is wider, there is less humidity. So it starts with some water content. And then because of the temperature here, the loading is thermal loading, not mechanical loading. You get the actual desaturation of the uh, uh, when we did this tomography, it took about one minute for the entire tomography. Now we can get the same in 20 seconds. Actually, to be honest, I learned a few weeks ago that we can do exactly the same imaging in three seconds. Right? Uh, yes, images. But images are not only uh, nice images, they contain information, quantitative data. So here is an example. These colleagues working on the spalling of concrete they were able to uh, uh, plot uh, height versus time and looking at the actual position of the drying front. These are measurements of the water content or the relative humidity, if you like. So depending on the attenuation, you can actually correlate the attenuation to the neutron to the actual level of humidity in the element. So all these is data that can be used to develop and or to validate models. Actually, it would be very nice to combine X-rays and neutrons. As I told you that they are not uh, alternative, but rather complementary. Is it possible to combine them? The idea would be, what happens if I have an X-ray source, a neutron source, and then detector in both sides? Is this a dream? Well, uh, this is not a dream. This is uh, doable and done. Uh, we started about five years ago. We installed in, the, in our neutron reactor, in our nuclear reactor in Grenoble, it's called the ILL, Institut Lolangevin. We installed an X-ray system very much like the one we have in our lab. And we're able to, from since a, a few years, we're able to do <coughs> simultaneous <coughs> neutron and X-ray <coughs> with the neutron uh, uh, qualities that are, uh, 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 that are written here and with X-ray detector that is, as I said, pretty much similar to what we have in the lab. Resolution less than four micro. Well, it uh, happens that uh, Grenoble is a, is a synchrotron, and this synchrotron is one of the good synchrotron, but not the best. But when it comes to neutrons, I must say, and this I can say it because there is no reason to be proud of it, it's just that uh, I'm lucky, not proud, uh, the source wave in Grenoble is the most powerful on the planet uh, by orders of magnitude. 
So I don't know whether four micron is a good resolution, but I can tell you that there is no way to have that resolution in any other place in the world, uh, combining it with fast. Uh, so a few examples to show you what can be done by using the bond. This is, again, a clay rock, is the color of Oxfordian. It's a very simple experiment. I'm sorry, this is even too simple. You take one piece of this rock and you put it on a sponge. So this sponge was coming from the bathroom of Alessandro Tengatini, came to the lab with a sponge. The sponge was full of water. You put uh, uh, this clay stone on the sponge. And this is what you see immediately. This is what you see if you have X-ray glasses. And on the bottom, this is what you see if you have neutron glasses. And, and you see, you don't see exactly the same thing. So here you get cracking. X-rays is very good in showing you immediately where the cracks are. And this is uh, clear to understand why. Because of course, this is like when you do a, a, when you go to the hospital because you broke your leg or your, or your uh, uh, arm, right? For those who do ski, this is, uh, I think, something that happens from time to time. You go to the doctor, say, doctor, I think I broke my heart. And you see cracks. You see cracks because the density is clearly the density of air or water, which is much lower than the density of the material. But with neutron, that is the bottom image, you see all this water going towards the cracks. So you see a clear uh, uh, face, that is the water, going into the cracks. And of course, this is water arrival from the sponge. And it's a mechanism in which you really, it's difficult to say what is the cause and what is the effect. There are two simultaneous effects. One is cracking, and the other one is rise of the water. And they are both effect and cause in the same time. Once again, you can look at images, but you can also actually use these images to measure things. And this is a very beautiful plotting, which you see as a function of the time since start of inhibition. You see different things, different curves. You can use X-ray tomography to measure the change in volume of the external boundary of the specimen, but also the volume of visible cracks. And this would be respectively the black and the uh, uh, red curves. But in the meantime, you can, use, you can use neutron to actually measure how much water is entering the specimen. So you can have a balance of the different volumes of water by combining the two uh, measurements. Concrete is a, a, a wonderful uh, case to show how the two things are complementary. Look at these same concrete things. We're talking of 70 millimeter diameter. Let's say concrete ready to be squeezed uh, in, uh, for civil engineering. And then you scan it with x-rays, and you clearly see the pores. Well, you being the pore lab, I think that you'll be happy to see that pores are very visible here, right? These are these white spots. You don't see them so well with neutrons. However, what you see very clearly with neutrons is the difference between cement and aggregates. Because as you see, the neutron attenuation is very dependent on, is very different for cement and aggregates, while it is pretty much the same in the case of X-rays. So can we dream of using the two things together? Uh, the answer is yes, but I must also show an example for soil because I'm a geotech, not a concrete person. So uh, other colleagues, this is Kim, uh, some years ago, were actually using the concept of combining Newton and X-ray for sun, that's Ottawa sun with water. They were using it for investigating partial saturation. And once again, I think that the two images are pretty convincing. They do show different details. Now, it is only in the last four years or so that some centers have started combining X-ray and neutron imaging. And this is for, to allow for simultaneous dual mode acquisition. Next is the one we have in, in ILL. There is one in PSI. There is one in the US. Essentially, there are three of them. Recent theoretical developments not only allow for aligning neutron and X-ray tomographies. Essentially, you can do, OK, I do my two imaging, and then I look at them together. That's pretty good already, but I can do much more than that. Actually, I can use both information to obtain one single image that is taking advantage of both acquisitions, which is much richer, but of course, more difficult from a mathematical standpoint. This is what we call joint X-ray and neutron histogram. And there are a few recent publications, uh, very mathematical, but extremely interesting in, in, my, in my understanding. Now, 
neutron imaging matters. Yes, it matters. And uh, matters to the point that uh, my university, ILL, and also a center in Berlin, the Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin, decided a few months ago to create a research, a joint research unit that I'm lucky enough to be the head of since uh, September 1st. This has been just created. It's called NI Matters that stands for Neutron Imaging for the Mechanics of Materials and Energy Research. It's been created in September 2020. The instrument we're using is the next instrument at ILL and will last for five years. The reason why I'm mentioning this is that uh, we are ready to get proposal for good science and we encourage everybody to apply to uh, have beam time is for free. You just need to be very good. And I'm sure that among you, there are many good ideas about the use of this. So proposals are welcome. If you want to send a proposal, just contact me and we'll, we'll go through the email. I think it's time to stop by telling you that I hope I convince you that there are tremendous possibilities from X-ray and neutron imaging today. I insisted a lot on the idea that these images are quantitative, they're data, and they should be treated as data. It's not only about showing movies, it's about actually measuring things. Of course, there are plenty of things to fix. There are plenty of things to develop. I think that the real challenge now is pretty much understand what can we do with all this amazing data we have. So linking imaging to modeling, that's the next challenge that I think is for the next generation. There is still plenty of work, but I think there is still plenty of fun ahead of us, and this is the positive side. You can look at breakage, roots, freezing. Uh, I think that uh, a good one will recognize this. Creep, compaction bands, fingering. I think that this would be of interest for, for your group. Perhaps in, a, in the next seminar, I, I could talk about it. Partial saturation, uh, ants digging into the soil, cemented sand. We're looking at lentils and beans, uh, many, many things. To do many, many things, you need many, many people. And, uh, and my last slide is just the slide that I always show by saying thank you to all these young kids. Some of them are now academic and some of them are less young than they used to be, but all of them have contributed a lot to what I showed you. And I think that's, uh, that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dino. That was very interesting and it's, uh, impressive and amazing what you have been able to do and develop over the years, uh, seeing inside and revealing the secrets of the materials. Uh, I suppose uh, if there is anyone that uh, have a question or a comment, you, you are welcome to <coughs> ask. Um, I have uh, two quick uh, questions. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for a very interesting presentation, especially it's very nice that you took the effort to make it understandable for those of us who are not experts in the field like myself. So thank you. Um, I would Go. like to understand. So, which uh, in the in the next uh, setup, so with the one with the X-ray and uh, neutron tomography, which technique sets the time scale? Which one of them is is the slowest one now that the other one is waiting for in each picture? So this is the first question. That's a that's a very good question. I I, I spoke quite a lot about space uh, scale, but I didn't speak a lot about uh, time scale. You're very right. Uh, let's say the the, the difficult part is neutron. Uh, we, we cannot be any, um, if you compare the two techniques at the same level, that means comparing uh, ILL and ESRF or any other synchrotron, it's clear that you can go very fast and very precise in space with the uh, X-ray today. Okay, this mm -hmm. is not the case with neutron and will never be, perhaps. Right. We do have at the ILL the, 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 all the world records, one after the other. We break records uh, every week. Uh, what was possible in 20 minutes, in 20 seconds, became possible in six, and then in three, and today will be one. So uh, that's an easy game because that's the leading instrument, of course. But yes, mm -hmm. neutrons are not as good, neither in time nor in space, as X-rays. However, do not forget that in next, we are not combining the synchrotron and the neutron. We're using just a standard lab uh, X-ray scanner. So our mm -hmm. X-ray is not the synchrotron. It's just a, a poor lab scanner. You can do much better. Remember that the so resolution in space uh, is 
I would say with our system, pretty much the same for X-rays. The solution right. time is uh, faster with the X-rays that we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another qu quick question. In, the, in the, the work of your PhD candidate where you showed the, the, the rotation of the single grains, um, so that's the modulus of the rotation, right? The, the, the angle of the rotation. So what yeah. happens if the, if the particles are too spherical? Do you have problems to define this rotation vector? If the particle is a, a perfect sphere, the answer is I cannot measure any rotation. Uh, or actually I can on the condition that there is a lot of character inside the sphere. Imagine that you a sphere that is a Dalmatian sphere. Huh? Mm -hmm. If the sphere is a Dalmatian, uh, then I can, may, I can understand that it's a turning just because I can look at the, uh, at the it's like your t-shirt. If the sphere is, is wearing your t-shirt, I can actually see mm -hmm. when it rotates. Okay, uh, but if it's it. just a white t-shirt with any motif on it, I cannot. Super, thank you. I see that there is a Professor Renan. So, Hi, Chino. Can Hi. you see me? I see you. Hi, Chino. So very nice talk. I'm very impressed what you have achieved in the past years with this uh, neutron uh, imaging and couple that to X-rays. My question is simple. You finish your talk saying that the next bottleneck or the next challenge is, is uh, modeling, from image to modeling. How, what is your vision about what is necessary to do to, uh, to reach this challenge? What is missing so far? That's a very, that's an extremely good question. And I, I will try to give the short version of the answer because otherwise I'll, uh, we'll stay here until tomorrow. Uh, it's, um, okay, to, to state it in a short way. Um, until uh, uh, 50 years ago, or all, the, the, all the models that we are aware of, plasticity, uh, every community has its uh, own uh, church. But let's say elastoplasticity or damage mechanics. All these have been formulated by very smart people by looking at the results of tests that were essentially forces and displacement. That's, uh, and people have been inventing concepts like plastic potential, ill function, hardening, beautiful concepts, totally abstract, but extremely useful. But all this was based on just the forces and displacement, bulk or boundary measurements. Now, today, with things like the flying into the sun, mm. uh, I do believe that we should try to use this and not only an LBDT and a LO cell. Now, how? Mm. By building models that are still continuum mechanics models. I love stress and strain. That's exactly the word that I want to use. That's the only way in which you can do applied mechanics or engineering. However, these models should be micro-inspired. So I do believe that this uh, type of information could be used in two ways. One, to reveal and to help us in uh, abstracting and creating different state variables. Uh, you know, we, we talk in terms of porosity. OK, but how about defining something that is not porosity? Uh, we have the luxury of looking at individual grains and the way in which pores evolve between one grain, the, among one grain and another. Uh, we might invent new concepts, new uh, anisotropy. Uh, you, 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 for those of you who know plasticity with anisotropy, what's the game? You have your formulation plus you add you're in an incremental uh, strategy in which you say, okay, the, the model is not good enough, let's add. But you know, when you're cooking pasta, uh, at some point you say, okay, rather than adding a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, perhaps I should go for another recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, so these micro-inspired models should be, I believe, uh, models uh, formulated at the continuum level, they should get inspired by what we observe. And then we have the luxury that we not only we observe, but we measure things at the small scale. Okay. So we can define variables and we can actually look at these variables and getting information from the micro. There is one caveat that's essentially the, the, the big thing we are that I didn't mention, but thanks to your question, I will, I will be able to mention now. Mechanics is not only about kinematics. Mm -hmm. Mechanics is also about uh, stresses and forces. So uh, uh, the macro word, it's easy. You get forces and displacement. On the micro, uh, I just showed you the kinematics. And, uh, and you don't go very long away 
uh, with only kinematic. So what we are missing here are the forces between the particles. And there is some work essentially using X-ray diffraction, uh, but we are not yet there. So I think that in terms of experimental challenge, uh, the, the big challenge is the one of measuring forces at the small scale. Uh, and just a last is, question sorry. before, because uh, it's a bit Christmas time, and in Christmas you write letters to Santa Claus. <laughs> and there are two places in Europe where you have a neutron source and an X-ray source within 200 meters. So is there any hope in the near future that instead of having a neutron source as you did and the laboratory tomograph, we could couple the two? Yeah, I, uh, coupling the synchrotron at the ILL is something that I've been mentioning and uh, discussing many times. Is there any hope? Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the answer is political more than technical. And I say, unfortunately, because I think that technically it would be possible to do something uh, in, in that line. Uh, politically, I'm not sure. Mm. Politics is much more nonlinear and difficult than mechanics, you know. Uh, mechanics, you can understand it. <laughs> you can write the good equations and with good boundary condition, mm. you get to a solution. Mm. Uh, politics is a bit more difficult. Mm. So yes, I share your hope. I don't think it's for tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Chino. Thank you, Vanessa. One more, possibly. General, can I ask a question? Uh, oh, Arthur, dear. Hi, Chino. Thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I saw a few slides on clay. I I, I love clay, so, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to uh, ask you that whether it is possible to look at uh, microscopic water and macroscopic, you know in micropores and macropores, uh, the water, you know, held in clays, because the resolution you were talking about was lowest was, I think it was five micron, but when we look at clay yeah, particles, which is less yes. than two micron. No, it, no, it, it's a, we, we have been working a bit with clay, so it's, uh, mm -hmm. also, I, I must say that clay are my first love. So mm -hmm. now I'm more a, a sun person, but my PhD was on clay, so I, 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 I understand your question. And I, mm -hmm. uh, we should be very careful. The question is not only about the scale, it is also about the quantity of water. Uh, neutrons are so attenuated by water that if you take one glass, imagine just a regular glass full of water and you put it in our uh, system, no neutron will go through. So a glass of water is too much. Uh, the water is that is like if you put a, a piece of steel and you try to go through with x-rays, x-rays don't go through. Well, if you put a glass of water, now, what, why I'm saying that? Because there is a lot of water in clay. And sometimes we cannot just image because there is too much. So we need to have clay in very small, uh, very, when I say very small, I mean it's really things that are milli, millimeters. Now, given that field of view, a few millimeter uh, specimen, can we actually resolve the pores? not anything that is below uh, for magnet. However, we can hope uh, to see differences in water. And uh, the, the, I would say that the good way perhaps to do it is playing with the isotopes. You can think of a clay in which you have a situation in which the clay is saturated with uh, normal water and you inject uh, heavy water. These two fluids will essentially interact like they were the same, but they will be visible in very different way from the, from the neutron. So you might discover there are zones in which the water moves and zones in which the water doesn't. Not at the resolution that you would like and I would like to have, but still this would, I think, would give you information. So playing with isotopes, I think, is another dimension, another axis that might be of interest. But no, the, 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 the scale of the pores in a clay, sorry. It's, uh, it's not with neutron, but not even with x-rays that we can look at. OK. I, ha um, I have a quick question, if, you, yeah. if you're right. available. That, that must be the last, I, I'm afraid, because I suppose we need to. <laughs> yeah, that's a very short one. It's just please, go on. please go on. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the, uh, currently the 
X-ray tomography, or I'm, I'm not sure about neutron, but can can we detect somehow the the shock wave of a stick slip motion, for instance? If we don't have to have the tomography, but just with the we just one one uh, stripe of uh, can we can we get the shock wave going? Thank you. You're muted, you know. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. sorry. Uh, okay, I'm not enough competent myself to answer your question, but I think that the answer is yes. Uh, there is one beam line, uh, not with neutrons, of course, but with uh, with X-rays, the answer is yes. There is one beam line that's uh, ID 19 uh, at um, at the DSRF. It's called the ultra fast tomography line, in which my colleague Bratislav Lugic, who is a, a research engineer at the ILL, is now trying to uh, test Hopkinson bar in the ESRF. And clearly, uh, as you can imagine, if you know what Hopkinson bars are for, is looking at uh, ultra fast uh, dynamics. Now, the thing is, uh, uh, is essentially, um, uh, how to say, based on the idea uh, that perhaps there are many things that you can understand just by looking at radiographies. Tomography takes some time because you have to move uh, to, to rotate. Uh, radiography you just go one after the other. So there are phenomena in which already radiography can give you information. And uh, so my answer is yes, but I, if you write me an email, I will be happy to share with you the address of the people you should uh, ask the question. That's yeah. Thank, thanks, Gino. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Gino. Um, I suppose even though this is extremely interesting, I mean, it should go on, but uh, I suppose there are other things on the, the schedule and, and uh, we need to close. Uh, so thank you so much to Gino for uh, giving us his talk. It was extremely interesting and really nice. You can see it with the questions. And it opens up for a lot of other questions and that's really promising, isn't it, for going on. So thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Thank you Gino. so much. And thank you to everyone that joined and thank you to Poor Lab for uh, organizing this. Um, highly appreciated. So uh, I look forward uh, to for those who, For those of you who have still some questions to ask, do not hesitate to send me an email and I'll be happy to, to answer any question. And if Gino have time, uh, I don't need to close from my side actually, but uh, I, I think we formally should close and then uh, you can hang on if Gino has your time to ask, answer a few more questions. So uh, I think we formally then say thank you, that's it, and maybe we stop the recording, and then uh, we can move on if someone has an informal question, as long as you are able to, to say with us. Thank you, Steiner. Thank you so much.